How is the drug situation in Europe today? What has changed? What are the new threats? Are there any innovative responses? What is the EU doing? This is what we are going to see together. We are talking about a very fast changing phenomenon in an even more fast changing world. Just think about how was the world three and a half years ago, before COVID, before the war in Ukraine and the impact on the entire Europe and before the economic crisis and the consequences of all those major events. If we want to characterize the drug situation, there are three main trends. First is drugs are everywhere. Everything can be used as a drug today and everyone can be confronted either directly or indirectly to any addictive behavior, but what is also new, to the consequences of drug-related violence. Ten years ago, when we were talking about drug-related violence, we were talking about Central America. Today, we are talking about the European Union and all member states are facing the problem. The first characteristics of the situation is the increased availability of drugs. And it seems that this availability continues to increase and doesn't stop or doesn't stop yet. Only in 2021, 303 tons of uh, cocaine were seized uh, in Europe. And uh, this was taking place in the major seaports, but also in smaller ports, uh, where it seems a tendency that there is a dissemination, a spread of, uh, of trafficking through uh, those ports, uh, mostly through containers shipping. But we also observed that the purity of cocaine has increased by 43% in the last 10 years. So, unfortunately, it means that uh, despite all the efforts and joint efforts of law, law enforcement, we don't manage to reduce and to have a direct impact. We need to continue our efforts. But it's not only about cocaine. Heroin seizures have doubled between 2020 and 2021, with 9.5 tons of heroin seized in Europe, plus 22 tons that have been seized in Turkey. They're also doubling the quantity of heroin seized the previous year in Turkey. Cannabis. We have seized in 2021 816 tons of resin, and 256 tons of herbal cannabis, of which the biggest part has been produced on the territory of the EU. And then we have the new psychoactive substances. We had 41 of those new substances that have been discovered for the first time in 2021. And out of the total of 930 that we have detected and that we continue to monitor over the last 25 years, 400 of them were found somewhere on the drug market in 21. So a very important uh, challenge for availability. But when we speak about everywhere, we speak also about production. And here uh, we also see that uh, the, the trend is towards an increase. An increase in the detection of laboratories we detected in 21, 434 laboratories coming from 360, 368 uh, the year before. We see that the scale and the complexity of those laboratories, the way they are conceived, the way they work, uh, is also growing. Uh, we see an increase in the laboratories producing some of them for the last phase of the production of the chemical process, cocaine and methamphetamine. The, the detection of laboratories for amphetamines is stable and temporarily the production of uh, MDMA or ecstasy and the synthetic catenons that are synthetic uh, stimulants has decreased. But we talk about the number of laboratories that have been dismantled. It doesn't mean that we can conclude there is a trend in decrease in that production. All in all, we have increased production and capacity for industrial level production for all those synthetic substances. And uh, it remains to be assessed if the small decrease observed in the detection of laboratories for some of those substances is uh, indicating a new trend in production and consumption or not. We are following that. 
Also, another alarming element is that in 2021, we detected 228 waste dumping sites uh, coming from the production of the illicit production of uh, uh, synthetic drugs. So, uh, ever bigger impact on the environment in the European Union that deserves all our attention. Let's move now to the everything. As I said, the classical distinction between licit and illicit, chemical or vegetal origin, hard drugs, soft drugs, uh, is not relevant to describe the complexity of the situation. First, there are new substances. Ketamine, in some groups or subgroups of consumers, is becoming more established or appears to be. As reflected in the recent web surveys we organized everywhere in Europe, where 13% of people interviewed who were consuming drugs were consuming, among other things, ketamine. Then we have also a new semi-synthetic uh, cannabinoid, uh, which is the HHC, for which uh, there is a, a, a huge increase in the availability and appearance on the, on the drug market. Uh, and not enough information for the moment regarding the risk for health, possible toxic toxicity, but certainly uh, uh, an overall message of uh, being cautious, remaining cautious, also because this substance is called semi-synthetic because it's produced from CBD that is uh, produced uh, from hemp, uh, which means potentially CBD, which is at the center of a lot of discussions for cannabis policies, may be considered maybe in the future as a precursor, which would change completely uh, the challenge uh, for law enforcement, for health, for the society, as a new subgroup of cannabinoids. And then we have the new synthetic opioids that recently appeared to have uh, replaced fentanyl. We have also the new, uh, overall, the new synthetic cannabinoids. Only in 22, we discovered 24. And altogether, in, since we are operating the early warning system, we detected 245 of those substances of this category of substances. Coming back to the synthetic opioids, what we observe is um, an emerging, a bit increasing problem in the Nordic uh, countries, in the Baltic states, uh, with uh, recently uh, some notification of an alert in Latvia, which we are further investigating. Also, new mix combining uh, what is for what is called benzodope or trunk dope in some countries is opioid or synthetic opioids plus benzodiazepines plus xylazine. Uh, and then we have the other synthetic stimulants. And finally, uh, one substance that caused some debate and created some problem, which is the nitrous oxide, uh, for which we have uh, issued a report recently. But if we look at those new substances, we need also to look at the harms. And here also there are new potential risks, potential negative consequences. Um, what we observe is whether the population consuming heroin is remaining more or less stable, and it is an aging population, still we see an increase in the time lag between the initiation of drug use, which is around 23 years old, and the moment where heroin users will ask for treatment for the first time. 15, 20 years ago, this time lag was seven, eight years. Today, it's 13 years. We also observed that opioids, and when we say opioids, it's not only heroin, uh, they are responsible or they are present in 74% of the fatal overdoses. We also can say that uh, in the context of general polydrug use, there is an increasing risk for polydrug toxicity. Finally, cocaine. Many people would underestimate the risk of the cocaine consumption. From the data we have, which is certainly partly underestimated, one-fifth of all drug-related deaths is associated to cocaine use or abuse. And then, according to the areas and regions in Europe, there are emerging substances and problems in the Baltic states, substances li like benzimidazole or car carfentanyls that are synthetic opioids are creating some problems. There may be some ketamine problems for chronic use, uh, 
uh, with the bladder damage and urinary complications. Uh, and then what is also new is today injecting drug use is not limited to heroin. There are plenty of substances that are consumed through injection. This means that uh, we need to take into account those new information for the responses to the problem. This is what we are going to see now. When we say everyone may face an addictive behavior or may know someone who's uh, uh, having an addictive behavior, the first question, of course, is how to protect. And therefore, one of the questions, what is the European Union doing? So the first thing we can say, there is an incredible progress towards a better knowledge base for evidence-based prevention programs. We have now a European prevention curriculum. Now, the challenge is to use it to train more professionals, as there is an average of 10, 15 percent of professionals working in the area of prevention in Europe that have received an evidence-based training or education. But it's also the need for law enforcement interventions for uh, cooperation and coordination between the European countries. And last week in Antwerp, uh, there was the meeting, uh, the ministerial meeting of the coalition of European countries against serious and organized criminal organizations, but also increasingly international, international cooperation. And this is why in the beginning of the year, the Commissioner, the European Commissioner for Home Affairs, Mrs. Johansson, together with the Minister of Interior of Belgium, Mrs. Verlinden, they went together to uh, Ecuador and to Colombia to uh, assess the situation together with their counterparts in those countries. And one of the results is that uh, both Ecuador and Colombia have asked and uh, have concluded a cooperation agreement with Europol, and they are planned to have a similar cooperation agreement with the MCDD. Next is from prevention. It's also what are the conclusions, what are the consequences, what are the questions? What is it that we know or that we don't know for treatment and for harm reduction? And here uh, we have new opportunities, but plenty of questions. The first is it seems that there is increased availability for cannabis treatment, including with online support platforms, applications. We don't know exactly what is their efficacy, but we also don't know exactly how can we attract, how can we invite people who are using cannabis, and especially those who have a problematic use of cannabis, how can we reach them for harm reduction interventions or for treatment? And certainly the major challenge caused by this uh, inflation of substances and the risk associated is that we need to adapt the treatment offer to the use and to the substance, including we need to reinvent harm reduction. Why? Because harm reduction intervention in the last 30 years in Europe, they've been thought, they've been designed starting from what was the problem 30 years ago, which was heroin injection use. Today. There are more substances, more different users, so we need to adapt the offer. And uh, we can observe that uh, in the recent years, we have 12 countries that have uh, established one or many drug checking programs. We have naloxone that has been uh, adopted and implemented and used as a tool to reduce uh, the death from overdose. Uh, of uh, opioids in 16 countries, and we have 10 countries that have adopted, designed, and are now working to evaluate their drug consumption rooms. Those drug consumption rooms being designed now, not only for injecting use of heroin, but taking into account what are the risks, what are the substances, and what are the needs at local level. Interesting development still a need for evaluation, and the MCDD is producing support for that purpose. We need also to see how better address overdose prevention, keeping in mind it is not only for heroin use. And finally, when we speak about prevention, but especially about treatment and harm reduction, we need to do more and better and differently for women and drug use. Just before to finish, Drugs, everyone can be concerned, not only on the territory of the EU, which means that 
we are facing what we call a global threat, which means we have a lot of uh, critical crises, humanitarian crises, uh, in different places in the world that have or can have a direct or indirect impact on the drug situation in the European Union. One example is, of course, the situation in Ukraine with the, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, with the impact on the citizens, the impact on the health system, the impact on the economy, but also the availability of medicines, including methadone. One of the factories producing methadone in Ukraine was destroyed, but also the impact on the neighboring countries, including the countries from the EU, that they faced the massive arrival of uh, people fleeing the war and the war zone and the potential impact for those populations, but also for the hosting population, for their mental health, for their safety or feeling of safety and the need for or the risk for uh, substance use or abuse and the need to provide support to them. But it's also uh, on more far places from Europe, for instance, the evolution of the situation in Afghanistan. The Taliban regime has uh, announced that it would uh, put a total ban on the production of, uh, of uh, opium, which in turn may have an impact on the production of heroin and the consumption of heroin on the territory of the European Union. The last information received some days ago, including uh, satellite pictures, are suggesting that uh, this control, this ban has been put in place. It's a bit premature now to assess what might be the impact on the drug situation in Europe. And this impact will probably not be immediate, maybe in one year or two years time. But we need to be prepared because the drought of heroin on the European market may have an impact, for instance, uh, reorienting some of the uh, opioid users to, uh, towards synthetic opioids, which may have also very important consequences. We know uh, the situation in the United States and the negative impact uh, in the, that country of the epidemic of fentanyl use. And then finally, to help the EU and the member states to address this problem and those new challenges, we are going to become a new agency. We are going to have a new mission. The EMCDD will soon disappear and mutate into the European Union Drugs Agency. That's important because we have been created already 30 years ago. And when we have been created, there were no data about the drug situation. We did not know how many people were using drugs, how many were dying from overdose, or how many were dying from AIDS. Uh, there was even not yet uh, hepatitis C known at that time. So reality has changed, and we are going to move with the new mandate from monitoring to preparedness which means that our new mission in the future will be supporting the EU and the member states with better anticipation and monitoring of the current situation, increasingly in real time, providing improving the various alert and alert system and resources, providing support to the member states to respond timely and with the evidence-based interventions to address those new threats, and then to learn, assess and to learn from those interventions, not only for crisis management, but also what is the best practice, what are the new lessons, for instance, from the COVID pandemic, what are the changes that have been made to the treatment systems and harm reduction that we should keep or that maybe we should disseminate through guidelines, education for professionals. Those are the new opportunities and the new challenges for, the, for our agency. This would not have happened without the support and the initiative from the European Commission, from DG Home, but also from our commissioner, Mrs. Johansson. And also this would not have taken place without the strong support from all EU member states and the European Parliament and all our networks of uh, colleagues, partners, including those who are already important partners and will become even more important in the future, which is all the representatives from the civil society. So we are there to address the challenge with you. And in 12 months time, we will say goodbye EMCDDA, welcome EUDA. Thank you very much.